in North Derbyshire. Apart from its famous crooked spire, it provides a setting for no particular architectural gem. The shops may look Tudor, in fact, they date back only to the 30s. What little of the town is old stands around the market square. Before the Industrial Revolution, it was a market town, and this was its heart. 25 years ago, the council decided to rip this heart out, to pull down the market hall and cover the five acres of the market centre with a vast concrete shopping concourse. Not only was the hall going to go, so were virtually the only old buildings in Chesterfield, along the street known as Low Pavement. Well, it would have been a, a major change in the appearance of the, the central area. It's difficult, looking at this now, to see exactly how it, the original shape of the market was, but low pavement runs from central pavement here, through on this line, to west bars there. The market hall stands in the middle of the marketplace there. So this development would have demolished the market hall, would have built over the main market square in that area, would have left a small market in the area here, on New Square, plus the fact that the whole of low pavement, the older buildings, some of them listed, would have been demolished there. During the 50s and 60s, city centre after city centre was reduced to a faceless concrete jungle. Developers jostled and competed with each other to smother the old with new concrete shopping mouths, and the planners and architects helped them. All that stood in their way were people like Graham Robinson, the development company, Hammerson, were chosen from a short list of three on the basis of the financial returns which they offered to the corporation. Now, our position began when the public first saw what the plans would really mean to Chesterfield in November 1972. There was a public exhibition of plans which wasn't well attended. Uh, there was a show in the paper of uh, an artist's impression, an ideally, uh, idealized impression, obviously, of what the development would look like. Uh, people began to realize that what they were going to lose was their marketplace and the open square. In just three days, 30,000 people signed a petition to save their marketplace, led, not surprisingly, by the market traders. Oh, if, if the scheme had gone through, it would have made this like a big concrete uh, monstrosity. It would have taken the heart out of the town. All we would have had would have been a big concrete building. Do you really think these buildings down here on low pavement were worth saving? Well, if you would have asked me when we first started our campaign, I should have told you that I don't care if you blew them up. You could put a bomb under them. My prime concern was to save the open market where I was earning my living. But as I got into further details with it, and happened to see a coloured photograph done of what low pavement and the old buildings could look like refurbished, then I was aware that what we was going to lose in Chesterfield, something that could never be replaced in my lifetime or my son or their children's lifetime. And that's when I really began to feel that, apart from the vested interest that I had, that it had to be stopped for the chip for Chesterfield and Chesterfield people. The battle for low pavement and the market was on. However, by the end of 1973, the plans had been approved by both the county and borough councils. Two public inquiries went in favour of the council. In 1974, under local government reorganisation, a new district council took over from the old borough council and instantly had a writ served on it, charging that the proposed development would lose money for the ratepayers. Uproar against the plan led to 10,000 signatures on a new petition in just five hours. At the same time, the protest group, the Chesterfield Heritage Society, opened a new front. On low pavement was an old building local historians believed to be a 15th century guild hall. They applied to have it listed, so protecting it from immediate demolition. But first, they had to make sure that it was what they thought it was. Well, uh, my partner, Michael Brayshaw, uh, moved in the day after the compulsory purchase order had been issued and the then landlord had moved out. It was a public house. And he eased in with an expert and various parts of the structure were revealed uh, and the confirmation was that it was a very old building, late 15th century, quite unique to sit here near the old marketplace. Um, we prevailed through letters, through various means. We even saw 
uh, the Department of the Environment at the highest level in London. And shortly, uh, we received a listing right at the 12th hour when we'd almost decided that we would go around the building and literally stop anybody from pulling it down. Presumably, once it had been listed, the battle was over and the council stopped trying to knock it down. No, immediately. Um, they were disappointed, of course, that we'd achieved planning consent, uh, listed building consent, I should say. Uh, but immediately they sought permission to knock down a listed building, which was a process all of its own. We couldn't believe this. This was quite unbelievable. In spite of the opposition in the town itself and disquiet on Derbyshire County Council, in spite of appeals from 13 organisations, including the Civic Trust, the council still pressed on with its plans. Why? Chesterfield had really, on the face of it, very little of worth of heritage worthy of preservation if you look at them individually. Now this was the situation and the people who uh, would organise the petition uh, we thought weren't aware of the financial implications to the council and quite frankly there are a lot of people that aren't aware yet even now of the financial implications to the council. So this was an overriding uh, I would think pressure from a different side that we had to provide for the many people that we cater for. So this is one of the reasons why we resisted as long as, well not as long as we could, why we resisted initially to uh, the conservationists. You were going to say you resisted as long as you could. I think a lot of people think that you did resist as long as you possibly could. Well, yes, we resisted until evidence proved otherwise. We had to be satisfied that we could combine the two. And I don't know of anybody else, any other town, that's managed to do this yet. So whilst it may be said that we resisted as long as we could, we're certainly the first of the towns that may follow. Now towns may follow our example because we may have been the instrument for saving other towns. So in fact you would now say that the council was wrong for all those years. It grimly fought to get through the Hammerson scheme. Well, I thought I said it about four times, but if you insist on me repeating it again, yes, perhaps the council was wrong. But the people who made the decision, made the decision that was right at the time, and I, I don't uh, take that away. Chesterfield will soon have a new, more modest shopping development, largely paid for by the National Union of Mine Workers. It's barely 20 yards from the marketplace, but the modern, functional building is well hidden from the town centre, standing as it does behind the old houses and shops of low pavement. The planners have gone to the expense and trouble of making the multi-storey car park look more like a 19th century engine shed than a car stack. And the old buildings of low pavement are being carefully and meticulously restored. The protesters won, but what makes them so sure that they were right? I don't say that we were. It's only that in terms of numbers, uh, the number of people who were prepared to say, we do not like what you're doing, against the number of people who were prepared to say, yes, we do like what you're doing, bear this stupendous relationship of 30,000 to 30. What do you think finally made the council change its mind and abandon the whole redevelopment scheme here? It ran out of steam. It could not find a new development company to go into partnership with it for the scheme devised by Hammersons. And I think they have become tired of the constant hammering of bad publicity and the successive delays which we have been able to put in their way. But were you rarely uh, ever anything more than an unelected, rather middle class, little pressure group determined to get your way? I don't accept the middle class, but certainly unelected and unrepresentative. And that, unfortunately, is the way that I think it has to be. Because no amount of legislation is going to uh, save our centres from the kind of desecration that was due in Chesterfield.